once you've accomplished a task, figured out how to do it efficiently, now train your replacement. Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Sean Reiser. Sean is the Chief Financial Officer for Harding Group based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Harding Group performs asphalt and concrete services for municipal and commercial customers is a supplier of hot mix asphalt and provides dump truck transportation for higher services. Prior to joining Harding Group, Sean spent over 10 years in public accounting, primarily for Somerset CPAs, where he traveled the country providing operational and transactional consulting and assurance services. Sean was an integral part in compiling, distributing, and presenting a construction industry survey during his time at Somerset CPAs, focusing on the Indiana construction market's financial, salary, and benefits information. Sean's performed various speaking engagements, including guest speaker at USC Marshall Business School MBA program on quality of earnings analysis, key performance indicators, and how to hold employees accountable, understanding cost volume profit analysis, and business continuity planning, both through internal transitions and external transactions. Sean has served as visiting lecturer at Franklin College, committee member for the Indiana Construction Association Leadership Development Committee, and actively serves as a board member for the Indiana Asphalt Paving Association. He graduated from Valparaiso University with a bachelor's degree in accounting and finance. He is an active certified public accountant in Indiana and resides in Fishers, Indiana with his wife and son. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Megan. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our discussion today about letting go of what we can't control. It seems particularly relevant these days in a world that seems to be getting more and more unpredictable. So let's get started. Tell me about your career progression and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. So back in high school, I got to spend a summer clerking for uh, my uncle on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And there, just learning about the stock market, um, how money moved is kind of how I got my inspiration to get into the accounting finance field. During the college years, spent some time working in banking on the front line as a teller, and then moved into the credit department, helping kind of compile financial data for uh, credit worthiness of, you know, loan collateral reviews. And that really helped start build the the foundational building blocks of really understanding balance sheets, income statements, risk, leverage points, all those kind of key ratios that we get taught in in college and then post-college years in, in practice. Then after graduating college, started working for a public accounting firm in Northwest Indiana, spent a couple of years there, moved down to Indianapolis, and spent about 10 years working for Somerset CPAs, where I specialized mostly in assurance services, kind of grew into more of an advisory role as I progressed through the firm. And learning and being able to do both advisory services and assurance compliance services really, I felt, made me a more well-rounded CPA is you see different sides of a business and different angles. You know, from an auditor perspective, you might be looking for one thing, but then when you put that advisory, almost CFO for hire consultant hat on, you look at a business a little bit differently. And having all that background and experience, I I feel like really prepared me for how I got to where I am today to be the CFO here at Harding Group. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a really well-rounded career. So are there any particular stories or career moves that stand out in your mind as turning points? 
Yeah, as as a young staff accountant, we had kind of our annual week of training, and one of our speakers had the phrase, if you've learned how to do a task, be it auditing a specific area in, uh, you know, accounts receivable, cash, what have you, it's time to then teach someone below you how to do that scope of work so that you free yourself up to grow and learn more and take on either higher risk areas in the audit world. And, and that was kind of, I really took that to heart and, and took it even beyond just the auditing is, you know, we've only got so many hours in a day and everybody's time is valuable. And being kind of a motivated person that I am, always wanted to move up that rung as, as quickly as I could, but be able to understand why I'm moving up and taking those bigger roles on my shoulders. So understanding that leverage model of once you've accomplished a task, figured out how to do it efficiently, now train your replacement. And I, I think some people fear when they hear train your replacement that they're going to work themselves out of a job. And I look at it uh, kind of the complete opposite way is it opens up so many more doors to be able to do what typically people perceive as more of the fun stuff of being able to do the higher level thought, strategic decision making. That's one thing that really helped me get to where I got to today, moving from public accounting into private industry you know, in public accounting, you can kind of control your own destiny. You're viewed as a profit center. And, you know, now being the CFO, uh, I'm not expected to go out and bill hours or generate revenue directly for uh, my company. But there's other ways that I can add value to the company. And that transition from public accounting to private industry, it definitely took me a little bit of time to get comfortable with what my new role was going to be. And I think the sooner people transitioning from public accounting to industry can understand the different dynamic from moving up the chain in public accounting to moving up the chain in industry really will help them on their career path. Yeah, and I think that that was really great advice. I, I feel like some people, uh, as they learn things, that, that those are the things they want to just continue to do because it's comfortable, um, but it's also a good way to get stuck in a rut. Absolutely, yeah. We, we always try to keep moving forward as technology is always changing. You know, we were talking about offline here a little bit ago, the challenges of technology and just being able to connect to the right medium. And, you know, those weren't problems that we had three, six, nine months ago as, as prevalent as they are. And, and also in the grand scheme of things, they're not huge problems, but still things that we have to deal with in a changing environment. So having that positive thought and knowing that there's always an answer out there and being able to tackle new things is, is fun and exciting for me. Yep. So CFOs, they're expected to always be in control. But as we know, some things are out of our con control and it can be difficult to let go. So what advice would you give a CFO struggling with this? And how did you come to terms with this yourself? Sure. A lot of it goes kind of back to that fundamental, if you know how to do something, kind of delegate it down. It's a challenge when you meet with your stakeholders, be ownership or a bank or bonding company, whoever your users of the financials are, that if in, in draft form there's you know something wrong with the financials or a question and you don't know the answer, it's always to say easy to say it's my fault or be able to know the answer offhand if it's something that you directly did. But that again, prevents growth of trying to control everything. And by setting yourself up with a quality team, accounting team, operations team, everybody's got to work together. The more that you can set up a plan 
and have everybody follow through with the plan really helps ensure that as the CFO, when you get your financial statements to be prepared and presented at the end of the month or your projections, that you know those inputs are right and you've got to have that strategic ability on the front end to put that roadmap in place and trust that the team that you've assembled can follow through. You know, internal controls and processes are things that I think are just so fundamentally important to a CFO that understanding what those processes and controls need to be can really get you out in front of where you'd like to be a lot quicker is developing that roadmap, implementing that roadmap, trusting that that roadmap is going to hold through and that your team has the integrity to be able to follow the roadmap. And if there's ever an issue that they are willing to come to you and say, hey, this kind of falls outside a norm, help me out here, instead of expecting you to find it and have them bury it and hope that it just kind of goes away with time. I know that's something that people who may struggle with confidence just try to bury things if they're wrong and hope that it doesn't get caught. Well, that, that can create so many issues down the road that having a good team with you really helps the CFO identify things that may not directly be in his control, but put the team in place to get that roadmap where you want it to be. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I mean, I, I think that great CFOs build great teams. And, and as you said, they're able to delegate tasks and, and build those teams and their skills. And I've read that control is often rooted in fear. So what do you think that CFOs fear these days? What's keeping them up at night? Well, I, I think just about everything under the sun right now is keeping everybody up at night, uh, unfortunately. Um, but just going back to that topic of controlling the, the things that you can control is we can worry ourselves sick as CFOs or really just anybody in general. But having a limited amount of hours in a day, resources in a day, You've got to be able to structure yourself professionally and personally to handle what gets thrown at you. So we as CFOs get a lot thrown at us in, in a short amount of time. So it could be things like, you know, understanding covenant calculations, cash flow projections, you know, being able to respond to COVID-19 and, you know, do we need to change the business model drastically or should we kind of stay the course for a little bit and see how things react? Those are kind of some of the big fears that we've been dealing with, you know, understanding revenue streams. Are there certain markets that you target that may not be there 30, 60, 90 days from now, given the response to COVID-19? And there's also been other markets that have boomed because of COVID-19. So understanding how you can strategically position yourself to get into those markets if you're not already there or continue your strong footprint in those markets. In our construction market, labor availability, skilled labor has just been something that construction companies have had to deal with for a really long time and it's not anything that's going to go away. So when you've got a, a crew of eight to 10 people, knowing that if that crew would leave your company and go work for a competitor, that could be catastrophic to what projections you've put together, business models you guys have put together. So those are the kind of things that are keeping me up at night and trying to be a, a best place to work for and controlling the culture, safety, and just rewarding our employees, letting them know a job well done goes a long way. Those are the types of things that we're trying to build here that are 
kind of beyond the numbers that we can control to make sure that we mitigate as much of those risks as we can. And when it comes to like cash flow projections, we do a 52 week rolling cash flow projection that gets updated about quarterly. And it allows us the opportunity to see 30, 60, 90 days out when we might perceive there could be, you know, either cash flow crunches or, you know, surpluses and, and what to do with those surpluses. It's, it's our chance and our opportunity to understand that fear and prepare with as much advance notice for that fear to let ownership or the bank know, hey, this is kind of what we're seeing coming down the pike. You know, if, if COVID-19 has significantly negative impact on us, it may not hit us for 30, 60, 90 days as what we're seeing in the macro economy. And now we've got an opportunity to game plan and try to steer the ship in the right direction. So that fear doesn't overcome us, that we use it as an information, a data point and plan accordingly on how to mitigate any risks that might come from that fear. Yeah, I think that that's also great advice is just to have a plan. Um, I think plans help us deal with fear. Absolutely. No, it's again, and having not just one plan in today's economy, but two, three, four plans, you know, here's a, a budget that we thought back in January and now today that budget may or may not be relevant anymore. So having a, an expectation of a worst case and a best case scenario and always knowing how that budget and plan can change accordingly. I think the biggest thing I've learned in my transition to the CFO side is a sensitivity analysis is critical in understanding how you can project those numbers out. So when we say, you know, I do that 52 week cash flow projection, certain changes in the market when you look at, you know, your budgets to actuals and what's happening, how sensitive are your various inputs to the overall impact on the market and your net profit? Just because revenues may go up or down doesn't necessarily correlate to a corresponding amount of net profit dropping to the bottom line. So understanding that correlation, causation, and relationship, I think makes a strong CFO to be able to go to ownership or, or the bank or whoever you have to report to and say, here's, here's what the plan was. Here's why we did hit the plan. We exceeded the plan or didn't hit the plan. And with a, a strong understanding of the detailed transactional level, uh, what it really takes to build up to that top line sales number helps a good CFO explain any variances from that plan. It gives your ownership and, and banking and bonding companies confidence in the numbers that you're putting together that allows them to have that comfort of things are under control, whether they're going in the right direction or not in the right direction, at least we know where we're going and gives us the opportunity to tweak the plan in, in a good way. I often hear that we need to let go of something we can't control when it's causing us problems, but what does letting go really mean and why is it so hard for so many of us? I think letting go means trusting other people mm -hmm. and as we grow in our professional careers, you've got to find people that you can trust and surround yourself with those types of people. But kind of going back to the audit mentality is trust but verify. So you've got to surround yourself with a strong team and verify that when you put that plan in place, they're following the plan. And there's always a balance of managing versus micromanaging and in you know today's environment of data need, needing to be reported quickly the month needing to be closed in such a short time period 
you've got to work with your team to make sure they're in control of their tasks and doing it in an efficient time manner so that you can stay on online with your uh, timelines and time commitments. You know, having key performance indicators for the accounting team as it goes to daily reporting or certain daily dashboards. But again, it kind of comes back to those sensitivity analysis, daily metrics. If you've got a certain throughput in our world, we have asphalt plants and we manufacture asphalt. So we know where we need to be on a given day and understanding if we're not hitting those expectations while I as CFO sitting in my office can't really control the throughput of that plant, it's understanding how do I communicate with my team, set them up for success so they have the tools they need to be able to hit, achieve or exceed budget. But yeah, it's, it is really difficult I think for myself personally and, and I think just CFOs in general to let go of control and the ones that do succeed are able to let go of those things they're comfortable doing and even those things they're not comfortable doing but being able to have a good spirited conversation to grow their knowledge base is i know i don't know everything about our business there's people who work here that know a lot of more about you know our asphalt process than i do and i try to sit down with our operations team every chance i can get to really understand the the details of the operational process to make myself a better CFO and help understand that interaction. And again, letting go of control of the details, but still keeping that high level 30,000 foot view in mind and making sure the ship is steering in the right direction, but giving people enough tolerance to make their own decisions and empower them because I know I feel rewarded when I get empowered with you're in charge of making this decision so it's on me whether it fails or succeeds and I don't want to fail so I do everything in my power to succeed and I think people that you surround yourselves with who are like-minded in that sense will take a task and go above and beyond and try and help deliver exceptional results. And when you can really get that team on board, it allows you to let go of some of those more day-to-day -day tasks and focus on the high-level week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year type thoughts. Yeah, and I think that's so key is, is trust, just trust in your team and trust that you know things are gonna be okay yeah, I think that that is definitely key to being able to let go and not be afraid. People, they talk about the importance of living in the moment, and we might hear about the different ways it's going to benefit us, and it all sounds great, but how exactly can we live in the moment when our mind is constantly racing, either worrying about the past or the future? This is a fantastic question. I struggle with it many days myself. Yep. I've got a young family at home and trying to keep that work-life balance in check and then just trying to keep business operationally in check as well can be challenging. Again, there's, there's only so many hours in the day and you can only put forward such an effort on doing every task and I try to make sure to give my best effort on every task and being able to focus on what those priorities are for the day or whatever time frame are and be able to cancel out all the noise and the things that you can't control. If you can't control it, there's really no point in spending a lot of time worrying about it is it's important to understand from a strategy perspective what impacts it may have on your business but you've got to spend your time focusing on how you will respond to any changes in circumstances so uh, as long as you focus on the true ebbs and flows of kind of the day-to-day -day and don't get stuck in the 
down the rabbit hole of playing the what if game, that's where you can really start to focus. And once you've built that good process that we talked about earlier of having a good team who can follow the process, knowing that your process is going to keep things kind of within the boundary lines of where you're trying to go, that should help keep the mind from constantly racing and worrying. If you know, here's kind of that best case, worst case scenario budget. And as long as we're living within those parameters, it hopefully will help give you a little bit of that peace of mind of we're moving in the right direction and it doesn't need to be fire drill every day, how to respond. So uh, I've been in this role for about two and a half years and this year has really been the first time that it's kind of been able to move to where things aren't racing and worrying about every day. And then obviously we have a global pandemic that completely flips things upside <laughs> down on us. Just, just when we thought we were starting to get things figured out, yeah. um, that's going back to, like you said, it's things are constantly changing, but you've got to be able to take a step back and realize if you've got a plan in place, and you're following that plan, it should allow you the opportunity to not focus on the what ifs and what could go wrong, but how do I keep the business within those boundaries? And you know, having downtime is important as well to keep your mind sharp, be able to get away with family, friends, what have you. So setting aside those handful of hours when you get home trying to either maybe not turn off the cell phone, but um, just, you know, leave it somewhere that you're not constantly checking that or checking the watch and having, you know, texts ding through every 30 seconds on you when you're at home. It's trying to remove those stimulus to separate the world is you're never really off the clock anymore as the CFO, in my opinion. But it's also important to try to carve a couple hours out personally to relax and finding whatever that relaxation is for you. You know, I enjoy cooking, exercising, spending time with the family and getting a couple of those hours in in a day helps keep that balance, reset your mind and kind of ease a little bit of those issues and challenges that you might have. So really understanding the true nature of business helps get you to that point of knowing what to really worry about. And hopefully there aren't too many situations that come up on a day-to-day -day or a frequent basis that really can deflate the plan that you've put in place in a drastic way. Yeah, I, I think it is all about finding a balance, which leads us to uh, our last question, which is what exactly are the benefits of letting go of the things you can't control? Yeah, there's, you know, so much focus is put on mental and physical health in today's environment. And I think being able to have a strong mental health is just paramount to being able to have a happier life. Focusing on things that we can't control is, is a fruitless exercise and, and it really just kind of drains our energy can make us an unhappy person, uh, unhappy disposition, and really just lead you down uh, a negative spiral. And again, it, going back to that setting the culture through the company, nobody wants a negative downer type CFO that's just doom and gloom all the time of, well, if this happens, this could be negative, this happens, this could be negative. Focus on the positive the things that we're doing well, the things that we can control helping empower our team and figuring out how to manage our team and delegate roles and responsibilities appropriately really does allow yourself to take a step back, take some of that stress and pressure off your shoulders and know that you've built that foundational building block for a successful business that you've got to keep managing, obviously, but getting out of the extreme minutia on a day-to-day -day basis will really help you kind of grow and just get that mental health, physical health, 
in a much stronger capacity than maybe if you just keep holding on to things that you can't control. Yeah, that's really great advice. Sean, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Megan. I really appreciate this opportunity and look forward to hearing future podcasts as well through this channel. Yeah, I really enjoyed hearing about your experience and learning about how to let go of the things that can't be controlled. As a type A personality myself, it isn't always easy, but I know it's worth it for both my health and happiness. So thank you again. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, to all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion as well, and I hope you'll tune in next week. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a great week. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personif. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personif can do for you by visiting personif.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personif. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personif.com. Thanks for listening.